Right, we're in Uncle Harold's workshop again. I know we've all been looking forward to this. And today, amongst other things... By the way, somebody asked you a question about this machine, about the gear. Oh, about the the um, the gearbox, what, yes. What was the question? Where did you get the gearbox from and what was it off? Well, obviously, I told you it came from Selby Market, which was an auction market. Selby Market. Selby Market, yes. an auction market. And they said it came from a butcher's shop. Right. So I'm assuming it was a mincing machine or possibly a sausage machine. Right. I just don't know. Yes. And did you but make the, a new... The actual thing was seized when I got it, so yep. that's why it was cheap. <laughs> but all I had to do was detach the motor and free the bearings in the motor and everything was okay. Right. And the gearbox was okay. And did you put a new output and shaft so on I it? I took the gearbox off the motor, you see. Yes. It was only attached to it because obviously you, you have two components joined. Yes. You know. Yes. So the shaft that takes the cutters, you obviously cut a thread on the end. Well, yeah, when you look in there, that's, that'll be a spline in there. Yes. And whether I've got the old spline or not, I'm not sure because... Would you have made a shaft then? All bits here where machines have been dismantled and put back together. Never throw anything away. There's some bumblebees floating around in here today. Don't worry about it, Harold. I don't know what I saved it or not. Right. There's no need to save it. No, no, no. But you don't throw much away. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. Anyway, so that's the that's the answer. It came off a mincing machine or something um, like that. And then, if you look here, I sort of changed the speed by a small pulley and a bigger one there. Yes. To get the right cutting speed for the cutters. Yes, because they have to be quite slow, don't they? Now, the only snag with Miller machines is the expensive things because you need loads and loads of cutters, which yeah. cost money, which I haven't got. I've got some old ones. But uh, I use it for cutting with a, a, a fine blade. Yes. If you want to make something intricate, cutting it in different places. Right. You know. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. So that's that answer uh, finished. So w what we're talking about now is last time you were talking about casting an aluminium nut on an Acme thread. Now then, down on the shaping so, so machine. So we're going to show this fine thread which obviously will be the almost impossible to cut a nut for. Yes. So we make one in aluminium to do the job. Right. Do you want to show how much slops on that? that that's the sort of mould that we would use. The spindle goes in there. You heat this up to uh, a good heat and pour the aluminium in. Open it up, strip it out. And the, uh, the nut's made and, and just You've just got to screw it hard to get it started yeah. in the thread and then just screw it off. Right. Put it in there and away yeah. you go. Warm the mould up, yes. yes. And the thread. It, warm it up until, for instance, you could just drop a water on it and it's flushed to steam. Yes. You haven't to get it to a red heat. Just something like that should be adequate. Right. And then the spindle would go through the hole in the middle here. You just put, put here something on each end to stop the aluminium running out and just fill it up to the top and that's it. And that's it? And just let it solidify. Right. Which doesn't take long, but then let it cool off, open it up and strip your nut out. Right, and just a bit of force. It's as simple as that. Just a little bit of effort to get the thread started in the nut and yes. then it just screws out right. like normal nut. And does the aluminium wear quickly? The aluminium, once it's... No, it doesn't. This has been in ever since the machine was built. And it's not a very big shaft. But what, you get a compression skin on the aluminium as you use it. Yeah. Which is a, a, offers resistance to wear. Oh, and right. So you get a good long life yeah. out of it. Sure. I'll bring the camera uh, I forward. I've never seen this idea used anywhere else. 
It's just my own idea, yes. as it were. It possibly is used, but I'm not aware of it. So, rather than machining an Acme nut, you cast one in aluminium. So, we're, here we are. The block there. And can you see where that's got the aluminium in? nut inside that block? That's right, you just strip that down, right. you see. Yeah. Do you want to turn the handle? See, it's instant response. There's only the slack in the spindle. Yes. But it's instant response. And this has been there ever since the machine was built. And it withstands the side thrust of the cutter yeah. all the time. So it does the job. I had a friend who bought a big massive joiner's vice, a proper big industrial one. And it was really cheap. But it was all taped up from this sort of auction sale. When he got it home and undid the tapes, there was no no torque quick release mechanism. So it was absolutely hopeless. That's why it was so cheap. Came to me and said, could I make him a nut? Well, almost an impossible task to make a half nut with that. So what I did, I cast him a nut in situ in the vice itself. Yep. And eventually he sold that vice to a commercial joiner or would use it daily yeah. on my aluminium nuts. Now that of course was a very coarse thread, like an Acme thread type thing, which was ideal for making them aluminium nuts. Yes. <laughs> so that saved the day. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. All right. And that was years ago, was it? That was years ago. That was at least 30 years ago. Right. Oh, 30 years, 40 at, years. At least 30 years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, because uh, you know, 30 years ago, no, the the three day week was a lot before uh, that, wasn't before it? Before the three day week was before that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the lights going out and all that carry on. Yes. That was before that. Yes. And but this vice was a, the biggest joiner's vice I've ever seen, and he bought it for himself. Yes. But it was far far too big to install on the home bench or yeah. something. Yeah. So he sold it to a joiner eventually. Right. Yeah. Obviously, you hadn't got the quick release mechanism, but you could wind it up. Yeah. And it was all right. Yeah, yeah. Because it was a good solid thread and a nice long nut. Right. So it would last forever. That thread would have been at least an inch, wouldn't it? Yes. 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 And it, oh, it was a good, a good, nice big shaft. Yes. yes. And the and one, one thing about it when you do this, or oh, if you're going to cast one on a shaft, never pick the warm part, pick it on the good solid part. For instance, if a shaft has some wear on it, don't cast there because it will lock, it won't get it off. Cast it where the uh, thread is good. Yes, that okay, right on the end. When it gets into the slack part, yeah. okay, it might not be, a, it might be a bit slack, but so would any nut. That's right. So it's no problem. No, no, no. And with that big thread, you didn't get a problem with the aluminium sticking on no, the... No, not at, nothing at all. But it, obviously, aluminium contracts. Yes. And you have to sort of work it. Well, you can see how slender that is. Well, that worked easy enough without breaking. Yeah. To screw it out of the die. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In the three-day week, what yes. things did you have to do? Well, well, the three-day week, the works had to shut down. They couldn't employ them doing anything. So, but it was a national thing. You couldn't blame the company. It was a national thing. Right. And it was the same when they had power cuts. You had to just shut down. And the workers just had to stand off. There was oh. no compensation or anything for them or anything like that. You mean they didn't get paid? That's just how it worked. Yeah. Because it was... A national thing. Yes. Couldn't help it. So did did you did you do quite a bit in the power stations? Oh we did a lot of power station work. Oh yeah, all, all the big power stations. We were in on those. Yeah. All the big ones. And during the three day week they were worked really hard, were they? Well what were happening there well, there wasn't enough capacity. So there were the bigger stations they were base load. And then the smaller ones were having to come in and go up and down, up and down to balance the load. Yes. But it was balancing a smaller load. 
Right. They would decide what the load would be because they hadn't enough capacity to do full load, you know, in a winter time. And so then the smaller stations were just up and down to balance the load. Uh -huh. And the big ones were just working flat out. You see, the station is a 2,000 megawatt station, say. So to get a 2,000 megawatt, you've got to use it to full capacity. So that's what the big stations were. Yeah. So they'd use those flat out. But then that wasn't enough. The bigger stations had to have the smaller ones. Yeah. But then because the load would be varying according to how industry were taking it or how lights were coming on and whatnot, the smaller stations were putting boilers up and down, yes. up and down, up and down. And um, was there a lot of damage to some of the big power stations? No, the big ones were flat out. They were all right. Yeah. They were working on base load, you see. Yeah. Now the smaller ones, they were working on uh, an intermittent load. And there's one particular power station. I remember going to it and there was some trouble with the economizer. And it was all due to putting the, it on high load and taking it off load and the economizer was expanding and contracting, expanding and contracting and it did some damage to it. Did it? And so it had to be repaired. Yes. Not and, and the economizers, were they like a uh, condenser? Were, were they a steam condenser? No, the, what, uh, what an economizer is, the feed water to a boiler without an economizer will go straight into the boiler. But it's a cooler feed than the saturation temperature of the boiler. So you pass the water through an economizer, yeah. which you use in the waste heat from the boiler to heat the economizer water up to saturation temperature yes. to continue and feed into the right. boiler. So it's recovering waste heat, you see. Yes. Yeah. So so it, it it's not there to create a vacuum on the oh, output. No, 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 no. It's just to preheat the feed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the you used to fit and these on ships. What used to happen in the early days of the economizer, yeah. the vertical one, invented in 1845, used to get loads and loads of corrosion, because the feed temperature of cold water was so low, the gases that burning so high sulfur fuels, which all fuels are, yeah. used to get sulfuric acid ah. on the tubes, condensing on the tubes, which used to corrode them away. You see, but then as power stations were developing, the boiler maker could make his own economizer. Yeah. So sometimes we're in competition with the boiler maker, yeah. you see. They still made the economizer. Because right. what so you're pitting your wits then against getting the best design. Yes. Yeah and if and you are a necessary part uh, uh, for efficiency with uh, all boil plants. Yeah, because there's no point putting cold water into a boiler. You might as well put hot water in there. Well yeah. But you need an economizer to provide the hot yeah. water. If you didn't have an economizer, you'd just feed it cold. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But of course, <laughs> the <laughs> techniques have changed all since then, and it's all far more complicated than <coughs> the initial concept. Let's just have a quick look at this mould. If you leave it on the, the, the bench there. Well, we'll, if you like, we'll have a look at the crucible as well. Oh, that'd be a good idea. So there's the mould. It strips down in uh, in three parts. Yeah, yeah. And there you go. So, if you ever wore that knot out, you Just could make another one. one. Yeah, yeah. But if you're making a knot for anything else, you can you can sort of with a bit of ingenuity, you can knock something together out of a tin can. Yeah. To mould. Uh, and then probably cut your knot into shape to fit into the uh, aperture. Yeah, 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 you know? yeah. But it's got to be with but this. What you do when you do it like that, you bed it in sand, yeah. so that the uh, <coughs> aluminium can't run out. But with one like that, it's all contained in there as aluminium. It can't run out. No. Apart from just sealing the ends. Yeah. With putty or something. Just something to stop yeah. it running. And you'll get some. When you've opened it up, some will have started running this way. You just cut that off. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Let's have let's have a look at the crucible. So there's the facing machine that we spoke about uh, last video. And Uncle Harold's just going to show us the where, how he used to melt the aluminium. 
All you do is just keep dropping the aluminium in it, just float belts and just scrape the dross off the top. Yes. Pour it. Right, and so what we've got here is a crucible. Now then, if you had a metal crucible, container, yeah, because it's a red heat when you're doing the melting aluminium, you'd be gradually scaling up the steel container till you burn it away. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A crucible is made for the job. So that's a crucible, and then there's some. I haven't used it for anything more. Uh, aluminium. aluminium. I haven't tried doing brass or anything. Right. So we've got some refractory material there in a bit of a steel the case. Refractory in case in this yeah. metal shield. Yeah, yeah, and which holds it all together. There's a crucible and clamp. The, the metal's absolutely protected by the refractory. Right. So you don't get any. Where not any burning away. And just use a big propane torch. And there you go. Away we go. And pour, pour out. Perfect. Perfect. When was the last time you used that? <laughs> Long time since. <laughs> <laughs> I've made castings for pulleys and such like. Yeah. Proper blocks. Yeah. In fact, I think if I look in there somewhere, I'll find some blocks where I've had a crucible full, no use for it, and just made it, put it in a tin can ah. to make a, a block of aluminium yeah. if ever I wanted it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've just got an extra here. This is something that Harold made a few years ago now. Obviously picked up a little uh, foot mounted two stroke engine and did a direct drive connection to a Lucas alternator, a uh, Lucas dynamo. And because it doesn't have any windows in it, that could be a tractor dynamo. Why did you used to use this, Harold? Well, the idea was if if you were stuck on site without electrics, you could uh, charge your battery up with this. Yes. And of course that... But, but nowadays, all sites have electrics, so you don't need it. No. But there you go. And of course, a, a little two-stroke engine like that, about one and a half thousand revs, would make that Just dynamo. A volt dynamo. Yeah. Brilliant. And it's been sat in this box for 20 years. We'll leave it at that. 